It, it is 1031 and we have some really wonderful panels. So I'm gonna go ahead as the chair and kick us off. So I would like to thank you all for being here. These are extraordinary times um, and this is a difficult new way to do a conference. So we know there's a lot competing for your attention on Zoom rooms these days and I'm really grateful to have you here with us this morning. Um, and in terms of just some housekeeping, uh, please feel free to post your questions in the question and answer forum. We are going to hold on questions, but if they come up as speakers are talking, feel free to post them there. We'll get to them after all of our four speakers have presented. For panelists, I'm gonna go a little old school. Um, you have at the max 15 minutes, and I'm gonna hold up a little number to let you know how close you are to time, to not interrupt you audibly, but so that you can see. Um, and then when time's up, I will interrupt you audibly so we can go on to the next person. I wanna make sure we hear from everyone here today. All right, so before we then jump in, I do wanna just take a moment and, and ground us here. Many scholars and historians recognize that narratives aren't neutral. And in fact, they can function to uphold the status order and systems of oppression, but knowledge production can also be liberatory. And that understanding of our work as scholars, writers, and historians is one that many on this panel here share today. So we wanna um, come to our work from that perspective and understanding that even as we are reconstructing narratives of people who have come before us, as we reach toward their human experience, we're engaging our own lived experience and reaching across our own subjectivities to those who came before us in order that this work we do might bring to bear um, something more liberatory for the world we live in and the way we understand our past. So to recognize this mode of working, which relies upon not simply neutral words on the page or the work that we do in our writing, but is actually a human endeavor of reaching across difference in service of liberatory knowledge, I just wanted to start us by taking a few moments, and this feels particularly relevant as we come together through this magical 21st century um, format of Zoom and the internet, to recognize where we sit, that even as we meet here and we share our work and our scholarship, we all sit in bodies, we all sit in locales. So I just wanna take a moment, um, just may maybe focus on your breath, maybe notice your feet, just take a moment here and really ground in the body you're in, which is the home to the knowledge you produce and where you're coming from as you join us in conversation today. I invite you to just notice where you're sitting, you know, when a building, likely, perhaps in a chair, maybe standing. Notice the community you live in, the streets you walk, the polity you are a citizen in and belong in, the state borders, national borders. So from that recognition that we're all sitting in different positions and with different perspectives and lived experience, um, I want to invite our panelists to share this important work on Afrofuturism and Blackdom, um, which I think will open up much better than I could do in this introduction, the power of this work to be liberatory. So our first speaker today is going to be Austin Miller. Uh, Austin Miller, I will, I will introduce our speakers, let them speak, and then move on. So Austin is a PhD student in history. He is a New Mexican, um, so I probably, like myself, sitting here in New Mexico, a bit sad that we can't all gather in the state this year. He specialized, Austin specializes in the American West and Southwest borderlands as a PhD student in the long 19th century. His research interests include environmental and rural history, the legacy of conflict, and intertwined roles of memory and identity. He entered SMU's Department of History in the fall of 2018. Austin earned his BA in honors in interdisciplinary liberal arts and history from UNM in 2015. And after spending a year teaching and coaching in Carlsbad, New Mexico, he returned to UNM in 2016, where he completed his MA in the history of the American West in 2018. Austin, I'll hand it over to you. All right, thanks, Allie. And uh, let me see if I can share my screen here. How does that look? Beautiful. Okay. Now then, just have to get rid of this toolbar so that I can. All right. Uh, thanks, Ali, and uh, and again, I, I would like to thank everyone you know at the WHA who has worked so hard uh, to to put this on. Um, certainly, 
uh, unusual times for all of us. Thank you to Marissa and Timothy for all of your hard work organizing uh, the panel and getting us all here to this point. So uh, with that, I'll go ahead and jump in. Um, I'm going to be talking uh, more so about memorial movements that materialized uh, almost a century after Blackdom uh, was founded. Uh, and so I will, I will leave uh, for other presenters to go back and talk a little bit more about the town itself. So uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, some of what I talk about will be, will be clarified uh, down the line. So uh, with that, various attempts to memorialize the travails and accomplishments of Black and pioneers emerged nearly a century after the town's establishment in 1903. The mixture of minor success and severe disappointment that accompanied each of these movements forms a mirror image of the overarching Blackdom narrative. Despite the sincere efforts of activists, community organizers, and elected officials, poor planning, lack of funding, and unfortunate timing doomed all but one of these blossoming memorial endeavors. I'd like to begin, however, with a rather peculiar confluence of history and popular culture. In the finale of the 2017 Netflix miniseries, Godless, an all-Black community of former slaves and Buffalo soldiers in northern New Mexico is brutally massacred by a marauding band of outlaws. Although the fictional settlement where the slaughter takes place is named Blackdom, this tragic downfall bears little resemblance to that of its historical counterpart. Despite the bloodshed that swept through the fictional community of Blackdom in Godless, the real Blackdom suffered no such moment of acute annihilation. Instead, it shared its piecemeal denouement with countless other Western communities whose resources ultimately proved insufficient to support their occupants. Thus, the Blackman community endured an extended period of, de of deterioration and abandonment rather than the gruesome climax portrayed in Godless. Given the US's seemingly inexhaustible fascination with violence and the memorialization of such bloody confrontations, if the tragic circumstances of this cinematic rendering had actually come to pass, it's likely, albeit through a rather grim brand of irony, that Blackdom would enjoy a more prominent position in the history of both New Mexico and within the Blacktown movement. Although wanton destruction typically provokes greater commemorative passion than does quiet dissipation, three distinct Blackdom memorial projects emerged nearly a century after the town site company's original incorporation. Only one of these visions ever reached fruition, but the recurrent pattern that emerges, diligent labor, followed by minor successes and tempered by eventual collapse, echoes the very history of the community that a group of devoted individuals hoped to memorialize. The first of these projects was initially promoted in 1998 when Roswell City officials allocated $1,000 from the coffers of the Main Street Roswell Project toward the rudimentary enterprise. The city council eventually selected a pair of architectural students from Hampton University in Virginia to design a series of commemorative installations for Cahoon Park in the northwestern section of the city. The interns arrived in Roswell in June of 1998 and spent much of the summer studying the community's history and surveying the remnants of various Blackdom homesteads. After nearly two months of research and preparation, the team unveiled their preliminary designs. In addition to various sculptural components, the plans included, quote, recreations of the town's church and school, a replica of the ruins, and a fabricated archeological site where children could excavate replicated artifacts, close quote. The overarching mission of the memorial, as stated in the design proposal, was to, quote, capture and evoke the lost essence of the community, close quote, namely, freedom, opportunity, and cooperation. Despite the celebratory tone of the accompanying newspaper article, which also reported pledges of support from the New Mexico Main Street Program and the New Mexico Economic Development Department, the project never proceeded past this announcement. After the students re returned to Virginia to resume their studies for the fall semester, difficulties posed by distance, poor communication, and funding procurement caused the Cahoon Park Memorial Project to wither. The second, an only successful attempt to commemorate Blackdom came in the form of a New Mexico historic marker installed along a desolate stretch of US Highway 285, which connects Roswell and Artesia. When the overly ambitious Cahoon Park project collapsed, a simple roadside plaque seemed an attainable next step, and the revised project soon, was soon bol bolstered by an influx of organizational leadership. In 2000, Langer Abukasumo, an Albuquerque arson investigator turned pastor, 
moved to Roswell to become the new minister of Washington Chapel African Methodist Episcopal Church. A lifelong civil rights activist and native New Yorker, Abuka Sumo assumed the role of president in the Chavez County chapter of the NAACP. With the Reverend at the helm, Roswell's NAACP joined forces with backers at City Hall and secured $10,000 of funding from the state legislature for the highway marker project. On a blustery October afternoon in 2002, years of hard work finally came to a satisfying conclusion. A jubilant crowd braved the unusually damp conditions to attend the dedication ceremony. Among the onlookers were a handful of Blackcomb's former residents and their descendants. Bright yellow programs bearing the dictum, speaking truth to power, were, distrib were distributed as a letter from Gary Johnson, the governor, was read aloud, proclaiming October 26, 2002, be designated Blackdom Day throughout the state of New Mexico. The ceremony was jointly sponsored by the Chavez County NAACP and the recently formed Blackdom Memorial Committee. And although participants found great satisfaction in the day's proceedings, yet another memorial movement was already underway as the joyful occasion reached its conclusion. The new memorial concept, which originated with modest plans for a single statue in downtown Roswell's Pioneer Plaza, began to expand as the project gathered momentum. In September of 2004, after nearly three years of persistent lobbying efforts, the committee received an appropriation of $100,000 from the state legislature. Days later, the Black Memorial Committee submitted their proposal for a New Mexico Heritage Monument and Park to the Roswell City Council. The prospectus outlined the vision and mission statement for the complex, along with an overview of potential attractions, including, quote, statuaries depicting the pioneer spirit of Blackdom, a museum for exhibits, photographic displays and artifacts, an amphitheater for cultural programs, and a cafe specializing in African-American cuisine, close quote. The expansion of the project's scope from statuary garden to memorial complex signaled a shift in the committee's long-term planning. What began as a purely commemorative and celebratory objective became gradually infused with the more ambitious goal of creating an economic attraction driven by tourist dollars. Despite this string of positive developments, the venture soon confronted its first serious obstacle. During a citywide capital outlay meeting in late October of 2005, Roswell officials reported that the planning phase of the project was behind schedule. Some blamed bureaucratic missteps, but others cited resistance from corners of the Roswell community. In the aftermath of this rather contentious meeting, a letter published in the Roswell Daily Record expressed dismay that the memorial project faced such opposition. The author questioned the implications of celebrating the city's legendary association with extraterrestrial contact while ignoring its local African-American heritage. The author wrote, quote, why the powers that be would fight a monument to honor the lives and commitment of the families of Blackdom, but approve a project dedicated to the aliens that is worth millions is beyond me, close quote. Nevertheless, the Blackdom Memorial Committee persevered and just two weeks later submitted a formal site request to the mayor's office and city council. With funding secured and a location finally selected, the members of the Black Memorial Committee spent much of the following three years discussing strategy for the next steps in the project's development. By August of 2007, the board of directors had expanded to 11 people and an architectural firm was hired to create a preliminary design for the newly rechristened Blackdom Memorial Gardens Complex. Gregory Waits, an architect from a Santa Fe firm, was chosen as the lead designer for the project. On May 19th, 2009, Waite submitted his design proposal for phase one of the Blackdom Memorial Gardens. The designs were organized around the four migrations that are typically viewed as watershed moments in African American history. The Middle Passage, formed by captivity and extraction from Africa, the formal inst institutionalization of slavery in the South, the Exoduster Movement and Great Migration following the abolition of slavery, and ultimately the post-World War II period of black experiences with segregation and civil rights activism. Waits then superimposed these four distinct sections over the blueprint of the Black and Townsite plaque, using barriers to represent the omnipresent effects of the color line. As 2009 drew to a close, the tremors of the Great Recession reached New Mexico. The state legislature, desperate to reduce non-essential spending in the face of drastic austerity measures, sought protracted capital outlay appropriations as a swift and relatively painless option for budget slashing. After all, 
These coffers contained money set aside for public use, but, had, but that had not yet been distributed to the communities and projects for which the funds were originally earmarked. When a new appropriations bill was signed into law in March of 2010, nearly a decade of toil was undone with the stroke of a pen, and the vision shared by those who contributed to the Blackman Memorial Committee suffered a sudden heart-rending collapse. Thus, the story of Blackdom comes full circle. The resources that sustained ambitious visions of both the community and memorials abruptly vanished. A community once bursting with opportunity was reduced to rubble. Where a Blackdom settler's modest home once stood, a massive heap of discarded railroad ties and shattered fragments of electrical poles disrupts the flat monotony of the prairie, reeking of oily creosote. Likewise, the land reserved for the memorial complex remains vacant inundated with weeds and windblown trash, another forlorn testament to failure and bitter disappointment suffered at the hands of inexorable forces. Through physical obliteration and absence, the history of Blackdom remains hidden. Blackdom persists only as an idea, preserved on the stained and tattered town site certificate and within the accounts of individuals who once called Blackdom their home. But weary travelers, weary travelers who exit the shimmering blacktop of Highway 285 and linger beyond the shade of the rusting picnic structures will find themselves rewarded with a fleeting tale of the re remarkable community of Blackdom that once prospered in the hazy distance. Thanks. I always feel like we need a clapping, you know. Thank you so much, Austin. I'm gonna clap. Um, I think that sets up really wonderfully to think about politics, memorialization, and power, which our panelists will touch on. So without further ado, thank you, Austin. Uh, our next presenter is going to be Daryl Cuba. Daryl Cuba is the Center for Public Leadership Fellow at Harvard Kennedy School, the Ivy League's first Wikipedia Fellow, and the inaugural Oral History Fellow at the Washington National Cathedral. Daryl is dismantling systemic white supremacy and institutional racism through hashtag mapping freedom, check it out, a crowdsourced equity, digital and emerging technology initiative that interactively documents and digitally maps freedom colonies on the planet. I'll put that in quotes. He leads the National Cathedral's inaugural video oral history project, Thus Sayeth Our Souls, the African American Experience in the Episcopal Church. Take it away. Hello everyone, thanks so much. I'll just get right to it. Uh, let me see if I can do this. Yeah, so I'm Daryl Cuba, um, and I'm a Center for Public Leadership Fellow here at the Kennedy School, while also being a mid-career MPA candidate at the Kennedy School as well. My project, the Mapping Freedom Project, um, seeks to map all the freedom colonies, and what freedom colonies we're calling the, um, this international resistance uh, to Western colonialism. If you've heard of Palenques in uh, Colombia, Macambos and Quilombos in Brazil, Maroons in Jamaica, all the Black settlements in the um, North American um, sort of region, that's what we're calling freedom colonies, communities that resist the Western colonialism, whether it was the original um, slavery or the Jim Crow that they were escaping, any sort of form of community, community that was intentionally created to resist this. So I should also say that my maternal grandmother's, I'm a relative of descendants from um, Blackdom, my maternal grandmother, who was Avis Clipper's uncle, which is my third great uncle, who is Duncan Clipper, had a son, Oscar Clipper Sr., who's my first cousin, three times removed, married Blackdom's founder's daughter. The founder is Frank Boyer, and his daughter is Edmonia, and they helped to found and settle the town. Before we go, um, before we get started, I would like to honor and acknowledge the indigenous land and life ways that I'm zooming in from. Malcolm X said, if you stick a knife in my back nine inches and pull it out six inches, there's no progress. If you pull it out all the way, that's not progress. Progress is healing the blow that the wound made. I mean, healing the wound that the blow made, and they haven't pulled the knife out yet, much less healed the wound. They won't even admit the knife is there. So we admit the knife is there as well as the gun and all other methods of genocide and slaughter that has brought us here today. And we commit to the full scope of healing and progress, not only pulling out the, the knife and other weapons and healing the wound, but providing restitution and restoring equity and parity through holistic decolonization and indigenizing methods and efforts that lead to freedom, liberty, I mean, liberation and sovereignty. I take this time now to acknowledge that I am zooming in from the territory of the dispossessed 
um, Pawtucket and Massachusetts on the continent known to many native communities as Turtle Island. And I acknowledge that as scholars and inhabitants here at Harvard and in Cambridge, we benefit from the continued dispossession of indigenous lands and peoples. we we'll also like to acknowledge the braided histories of slaves and freed slaves who were forcibly stolen and brought to these lands and the intertwining of these histories with the stories of immigrants who, work in the, who worked in the kitchens, the houses and the fields. So today we celebrate the achievements and, uh, and, resilient, and resilience of Native communities and use our position to amplify the voices of Indigenous students even here on campus. We respect the knowledge of the land on which we gathered as occupied and unceded territory. We honor and give thanks and gratitude to the Pawtucket and the Mas Massachusetts, the ancestral traditional stewards of this land throughout the generations who allow the enduring relationship that exists between Indigenous peoples, indigenous peoples and their traditional territories. Mm -hmm. And the Settler University, to occupy these lands known in the Eurocentric epistemology as Harvard, the USA, and Cambridge. We pay respects to the elders past and present to teach our children that America was discovered erases the millions of indigenous peoples who were the original stewards of the land we now call the US. It also erases the, erases the indigenous peoples that thrive and care for this earth. As in individual members of these institutions and systems, we can do more to move toward decolonizing practices in all aspects of our lives. So why do we do a land acknowledgement? The land acknowledgement comes from the desire of many Native people across the U.S. and Canada to enter into the stream of public discourse, not as a noble memory, long past, or as a social problem, but as the progenitors of an ongoing relationship between people, land, and social and technical worlds. We do land acknowledgements to bring those voices and that relationship into these rooms. I ask permission from the elders of these communities to proceed with our communion because we do stand on Turtle Island on unceded territory. Every community owes its existence and vitality to generations from around the world who contributed their hope, dreams, and energy to making the history that led to this moment. Some were brought here against their will, some were drawn to leave their distant homes in hope of a better life, and some have lived on this land for more generations that can be counted. Truth and acknowledgement are critical to building mutual respect and connection across all barriers or heritage and difference. We begin this effort to acknowledge what has been buried by honoring the truth. Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us here together here today. And please join us in covering such truths at any and all events. You can begin by using websites such as native-land.ca. So the Mapping Freedom Project was my uh, oral history Master of Arts thesis at the Columbia, um, at Columbia University in New York City. And um, again, it was to document and map all of the freedom colonies throughout the colonial pathways. For my thesis, I focused on Shankleville, which is in deep east Texas on the border of um, Louisiana and, and Texas. The Raramori, the which is an indigenous community that escaped the Spanish in northern Mexico in the Copper Canyons um, as the Spanish sort of tried to invade and conquer. Uh, Weeksville, which is a uh, freedom colony in Brooklyn, New York, and Nicodemus, which is in Kansas, in Nicodemus, Kansas. So since the inception of Western colonialism, to sort of contextualize all this, the targeted peoples who were racialized as, as non-white would, uh, would escape the terrorism of what I'm calling racialized inherited phenotypic, hypodescendant, one-drop rule, chattel Atlantic slave trade economy, rifot caste, uh, slave camp, camp enslavement, known as plantations. So the indigenous mass genocides, Jim Crow, black coals, and other human rights abuses were developed by, by European colonists to justify the genocides and the taking of land and resources from the people and enslaving Africans. So these groups would escape and create their own colonies and thus successfully protect these safe spaces. So you again, Palenques, Quilombos, and Macambos, and, and Maroons are some of the names that they're known throughout the different um, colonial pathways. Freedom countries like Haiti and Liberia are also being considered uh, freedom colonies, and then the numerous freedmen settlements across the North American continent, and also some that exist in Africa and Australia. So San Basilio de Palenque was one of the first ones um, where the enslaved Africans sort of uh, escaped the, 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 the sort of torturous plantation, the slave camps, and ran into the hinterland to create uh, what would become Basilio de, uh, Basilio, the Palenque de San Basilio. Um, but there are so many more throughout the colonial pathways. There are 5,000 in the US at least. 580 have been found in Texas. The first in the U.S. was uh, Fort Mose, which is in what is now called Florida, uh, which was found in 1738. So along the Western colonial circuits, these stories and these events are plethora. 
Um, but um, in, in, in 2005, two white guys, Tad Simpson and James Conrad, H. Conrad, tried to tell the story of the um, Texas freedom colonies. They actually called them freedom colonies. To the right is the book that they wrote um, about the independent black Texans in the time of Jim Crow. And what they said sort of stood out to me and was I was and I used it throughout my thesis. Um, so they said so compelling to historians has been this dark image of the degradation of, of landless blacks, of the rise of sharecropping, debt slavery, the neo plantation, and Jim Crow apartheid that they often fail to notice a counter movement. Focused as they were on the triumph of sharecropping and the accompanying deg degradation of blacks in the Deep South, historians neglected the countercurrent of black landowners on settlements. Numbers are difficult to estimate, but this ubiquitous, unremarked internal exodus to local freedom colonies must have dwarfed the famous move north. And this is um, them talking about the freedom colonies in Texas after slavery. So we know of Blackdom and Vado in um, New Mexico, and there are many, many, many other, again, I mean, up to 5,000 that have been sort of estimated here in, here in the U.S., but they're sort of, um, sort of noticing that historians and storytellers and media ignored these stories because they were so focused and so compelled on telling the story of the degradation of blacks and created this sort of dark and negative image. Texas A&M's Dr. Andrea Roberts has found over 580 of these communities in Texas with her Texas Freedom Colonies Project. Um, you can look up the Texas Freedom Colonies Project. She also maps all of these communities in Texas and she tells her stories at Texas A&M. Um, so other scholars have started to share the findings of such regional communities as well, as we see with Dr. Timothy Nelson's Blackdom thesis project. Um, but these communities have always sort of known about their, you know, the importance of their communities. I, I'm a descendant of quite a few of these spaces, Shankerville, as well as um, relatives from Blackdom. Um, and they have historical societies, homecomings, restoration projects, newsletters that I'm always inundated with um, that have been undertaken by these communities and their, um, their descendants. I was lucky enough to interview Erica Lively, who is a descendant of one of the Nicodemus founding families in Kansas and the Dry in uh, Colorado. I don't think the clip will work today. I don't think we have too much time for it, but she created a uh, sort of art project called Lost Ghosts of the Dry, where she sort of, uh, which is an art exhibit about her ancestors' journeys um, to create Nicodemus and, and also then the Dry. So her great grandmother, or great great grandmother, uh, sort of helped to create the local newspaper, the Nicodemus Cyclone, which sort of documented this life in Kansas and Colorado of Black people with the, within these freedom colonies uh, settings. And she now has a 500 page term of work that she has to now sort of share with the world to disrupt what she calls the silence around this event or this phenomenon. So mapping freedom is powered by Google's GIS. And of course, you know, this is a public facing crowdsource, open access, open source knowledge ed equity project that um, allows people to go in and sort of designate um, uh, freedom colonies and, and to sort of, you know, tell the sp stories about them and link to any sort of media. Um, I'm also creating the International Association of Freedom Colonies, which is why I'm, I'm here at the Kennedy School, um, to sort of bring all these communities together and to think about ways that we can share best practices for preservation, restoration, and conservation. I won't play the videos today, but again, I mentioned San Basilio de Palenque, which is one of my um, thesis uh, studies. Shankleville, which is in Newton County, Deep East Texas. Again, these communities have constantly told their story. Just the mainstream you know, the media or scholarly uh, worlds have sort of ig ignored them. Um, the Raramori, there's many, many um, sort of uh, media about them. There were some books written from some guy who found that they, uh, the way they ran <laughs> sort of was uh, developed from the founding of sort of their, their um, their settlement as they ran from the Spanish and developed these amazing running abilities. So Weeksville in Brooklyn, again, um, in New York, this is a very famous um, place. Um, the New York City uh, Council has designated Weeksville as a cultural, it's called a SIG, I'm gonna get the thing wrong, but it's designated to have a fund every year. So Weeksville will never have to self-fund at least its basic operations. So Nicodemus, Kansas, again, that's a major story. Um, Nicodemus is actually a national historic site on the National Park Service in Kansas. And there's been lots of work to sort of tell that story as well. 
So how do we get to a place where there's a need for the creation of freedom colonies? As the uh, first black Australian to uh, earn a PhD from Harvard, um, Bobby Sykes sort of had a famous saying, what post-colonialism had they left? And she was, you know, talking about the fact that we are still colonized people. What we're speaking English, which is not indigenous to the Americas, and so thus is a colonized language and culture. Being branded black is the Jane Elliott, um, who is an anti-racist activist. She has a lot of great works. Um, she's a great accomplice as a white woman who goes around sort of disrupting the the, the, the absurdity of racialization mm. that was created by the colonial elite to um, convince their European lower classes to come to the colonies and then thus wreak havoc on the people that were going to be considered non non-white. So the intervention of white of the white people, Columbia's professor Hamid Dabashi um, in 2017 uh, again raised um, the 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 the, uh, the advent of the absurdity of racialization. He famously said, you know, there are no white people, there are no black people, there are no red, yellow, brown, blue, or crimson, or any other. Oh, I'm sorry. Any other people. Um, these are all socially constructed delusions, delusions though with real frightful, murderous, and genocidal consequences. So he's talking about the creation, the, 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 the fact that the colonial elites from Western Europe created race, created the, the, the construct of whiteness to convince their lower classes to immigrate for a better life, to become white, and then to police all the people that were not white. And because Europe had just come from this feudal sort of black, um, this dark ages, they implemented all the sort of um, um, brutal or, or, or brutalities that Europe has sort of spent thousands of years perfecting against its own people to now use against people um, branded not white. Of course, we know the Atlantic slave trade, and then even after slavery was ended, we know like there were black, um, the Black Coles, Jim Crow, all and, manner of horrible time. You're at time. Can you wrap up with like 30 seconds? Sure. So, so just to contextualize, um, the, the need for freedom colonies came from the Western colonial, um, the, uh, Western co um, colonizers need to um, sort of keep order and to have the colonial project work as needed by creating race and thus the freedom colonies or the people who created the freedom colonies were rushing away from that. And I'll end there. Thanks. Wonderful, Daryl. Thank you so much. I'm thinking of the, as an Americanist, I always go back to Bacon's Rebellion and that, that moment of creating whiteness and separating the poor white. So I, I won't I won't go on, but you've raised some really important aspects of this history. And appropriately now we'll turn to Dr. Timothy Nelson, who's going to give us like the 19th, early 20th century. So not quite that far back, but he's going to pick up some of the themes that you set up for us about the history that leads to these colonies. Um, so I'll introduce Dr. Nelson um, and thank him for his work organizing our panel. Dr. Timothy E. Nelson's multifaceted work concerns racism, ambition, and a search for opportunity. These themes were revealed in his 2015 PhD dissertation entitled The Sign Significance of the Afro Frontier, a welcome departure at the WHA, I'd like to say. Uh, Dr. Nelson was born in South Central LA, raised in Compton during the early 1990s in the wake of race and class-based conflict with the LAPD. He earned his PhD from UTEP at the University of Texas at El Paso. Thanks, Dr. Nelson, take it away. You're still muted. Unmuted, right? You can hear me? Great. Okay, so uh, piggybacking on um, uh, um, everything that's, that, that's been said about memory and uh, the colonies and why, I'm going to present you with a narrative that kind of centers black people in their narrative. So we'll start here and you can see the trajectory and now we'll go, okay. So in the summer of 2020. Sorry to interrupt. Can you can share you, your screen so we get a larger view? Oh, you can't see, okay. How, how do I do that? You should see at the bottom a share screen option in the middle bottom bar. 
Okay. I'm not sharing my screen. It's a Prezi. Oh, okay. Can everyone see it? Yes? It's, Is it's it too cool. small? Oh, here Can we I go. I'll just suggest everyone use the speaker view, and that seems to work for me. Sorry to interrupt. I want to make sure we see this. Oh, okay. Okay, great. Okay, great. Because I do want you to indulge a little bit in the uh, evidence, because uh, that's that's what I'm, I'm, I'm doing here. Okay. So, uh, in the summer of 2020, uh, it began with the racial violence similar to the assaults perpetuated during the summer of 1919, a period often referred to as Red Summer. Black people on horseback, born and raised in Compton, was a vivid show of anti-racist force. June 9th, 2020, Black cowboys and Black cow, cowgirls from Compton graced the pages of the New York Times under the headline, Evoking History, Black Cowboys Take to the Streets. For people who grew up in Hub City, it was uh, more of our reality. Leaving the Afro frontier town to occupy space in places like Southern California, Oakland, and Harlem, to engage America's roaring 20s, Black cowboys continued to maintain a vibrant culture amongst themselves. A historical narrative sickness has concealed a brief period at the turn of the 20th century when black people preserve their internal structures behind the Du Boisian veil of double consciousness. Blackdom was a real place located at the southeastern section of the New Mexico territory. The Afro frontier town was part of a black colonization movement that operated on a continuum influenced by ministers, military, and black Freemasons. After the Plessy decision in 1896 established the separate but equal doctrine, black institutions evolved to take advantage by encouraging a separate and equal response. Blackdom was a real place that started with an inherited idea. The Afro frontier town manifested at the turn of the 20th century for African American for African descendants under the conditions of American blackness, the idea for blackdom developed throughout the 19th century. In the 20th century, although blackdom existed as a town for a brief moment, self determination and how to achieve it were exemplified in the experiment. Significant to the black and ambitious, blackdom town site was a proof of concept for how to deliver on the promise of God's sovereignty. In practice, black demites pooled land to build a 10,000 person all black municipality. At the core of their movement was the exploitation of land through the homestead process. And again, identifying how close it is to the Mescalero Reservation. Blackton was on reservation land. In 1900, black people totaled less than 200 in Chavez County. And most of them were represented at the beginning of the colonization scheme. From the state of Washington to South Carolina, black demites advertised the organization of an Afrotopia. On September 9th, 1903, the Santa Fe New Mexican reported the incorporation of the Blackton Townsite Company and its articles of incorporation with the names of 13 men and their intentions. Isaac Jones, Blackton Townsite Company's first president, first vice president, began his homestead in April of 1903. In 1905, Isaac Jones became the first Black Demite co-founder to complete a homestead. The basic process took three to 10 years. In 1909, after minimal participation in the colonization scheme, Blackdom was revived as a way to mitigate the impact of New Mexico's impending statehood and the shift from federal to local power. 
Blackdom's elite owned land, but owning land wasn't enough to realize their Afrotopic dreams. Located 20 miles south of Roswell, Blackdom was a small enclave of land owning Black people. Blackdomites needed a collective action to deliver on the promise of their intersection. During Blackdom's revival after 1909, Blackdom included the significant striving of Black women as they began participating in the homestead process more fully. Maddie Moore, Pernicia Russell, and Ella Boyer were a few who chose to engage the world as part of Blackdom's homestead class. Blackdom's growth intensified with the passage of the Homestead Enlargement Act of 1909. The township increased enough that Black Demites organized a school and reached out to the territorial government for curriculum. Revival included educating the next generation by also projecting an intersectional Blackness from behind the Du Bois and Vale. For two years, Harold Coleman, a newspaper ads man from back east, led the advertising campaign published in the Crisis Magazine, separated or separate and equal, Black Demites projected intentional Blackness as, and God's sovereignty. After a few privileged Black travelers reported back to the migrating ambitious Black masses, Blackton became a beacon for the illuminated. In revival, Blackdom became a real place and more than a refuge. Blackdomites preferred farmers to city folk for the sake of increased production. Everyone was required to adjust to the steep learning curve of dry farming. The Agricultural Society was a community set on living by God's divine law of sowing and reaping. Seed time and harvest time were different on desert prairies, but the ambitious frontier scheme was refined into a process with predictable outcomes for investors. In 1914, as a signee for Maddie and Pernicia, Frank Boyer completed the land patent for Blackton's 40 acre town square. On August 11th, 1916, the Rio Grande Republic reported George Malone admitted to the New Mexico bar and identified as the first Negro to do so. Blackton's revival backdrop. Included the Mexican Revolution raging in the borderlands as the U.S. entered into World War. Pushed to the forefront, Black children were conscripted into military service. People under the conditions of American Blackness, patriotic to a separate but equal system, Black Demites put the future of the small village on hold and shifted their activity 20 miles north into Roswell. Meanwhile, 20 miles north in Roswell, Mitty Moore went from famous to hyper-visible to infamous. As patriotism fueled the war effort, the new, e the new era became a rationalization for raids on her body business at 201 South Virginia Ave. During the shift to Roswell, the image of Black people was under assault across the world with D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation. Black bodies were under constant threat in the second wave of the Ku Klux Klan in the Roswell Daily Record, Roswellian leaders advertised the showing of Birth of a Nation and, uh, uh, um, and, lect and, and offered lectures on Americanism, which was radicalization before the incorporation of a Klan chapter in the city. Mitty Moore, Wilson, became the antithesis of the new patriotic fervor of the citizen soldier. She occupied the Black female public image in the region. Meanwhile, on July 21st, 1917, the Roswell Daily Record reported Ezel Ragsdale had been drafted from the unincorporated Afro frontier town and the family prepared him for deployment, which included putting his homestead process on hold. 
The women of Blackdom did their part on many fronts. One of their major tasks was to diversify the Black female image in Chavez County. The women of Blackdom hosted a few inter-ethnic bandage knitting parties for the troops on the front, uh, for the troops on the front line. Curiously, the women of Blackdom staged the intersectional gathering in the window on Main Street. Nevertheless, in the fall of 1917, Midi led the headlines on trial for attempted murder of her fiance. John Wilson uh, aggravated her enough that she pulled out her revolver and shot two holes in his coat, missing him completely. The police thought they had her, but she got off. Mitty was on the margins of Blackton's society and Blackton women were on in her periphery. Mitty stayed unaffiliated prior to 1919, even though she began a homestead in 1915, three miles south of Blackton Town Square. She needed witnesses to vouch for her homestead progress under the threat of federal perjury charges. And new, and, and, and new Blackton leadership legitimized her claim in the fall of 1919. In the spring of 1922, Mitty completed her final homestead proof for a whole square mile. And by the summer, Blackton sold their church and the town faithful migrated outward. Ella and, Ella and half the Boyer family moved to Vado. Although there was an exodus from Blackdom after 1919, the town business was stronger than ever. The next generation took over as America entered the Roaring Twenties in post-war euphoria. December 31st, 1919, the Roswell Daily Record reported Will Pool Acreage. Blackdom Oil Company was then incorporated and um, the town was ready for the Roaring Twenties. That's it. I don't think we need the applause. <laughs> I heard a little bit in the back, but... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's keep it going. Thanks, Dr. Nelson. This is so... Um, really wonderful array, array of threads. I actually want to hear more about the Roaring Twenties. So you've left you've left me on the edge of my seat. That's why I did that. You know, I got a book to do you some, <laughs> at some point. So, you know. <laughs> got to keep this coming. So um, thank you for that. With that, we'll turn to our final presenter, Janice Dunahoo. Janice, uh, I hope I've got that name, last name pronounced correctly, is a historical columnist for Roswell Daily Record with a weekly article about local history under the headline, Historically Speaking, and chief, chief archivist for the Historical Society of Southeastern New Mexico. In addition, Dunahoo is a contributing author for a book on notable black women in Texas history, currently in process. You'll have to give us the information about where to find that, Janice, and a historic public speaker. She has published in magazines such as Wild West Journal, West Texas Historical Association Newsletter, and New Mexico State Historical Association. And I, I think that with these complicated technological situations. We may not be able to see you, Janice, but I believe we hear you. Um, so go ahead and take it away and I will hold up um, and let you know when you have five, two, and one minute remaining. Thank you so much and I apologize for no camera. Um, I don't know what happened there, but um, hopefully our slideshow will work. Um, I want to thank the speakers before me. Allie, your words were just right in line with what I was thinking for presenting uh, the life of George Malone, who was the first black attorney in the state of New Mexico. I often think of the times and the people who walked the streets of Blackdown and what their life was like, even in the short period that they were there and the fun times they had and the, the holidays they shared and the meals they shared and the school classrooms and the ladies sewing groups and, um, George Malone is just one of many, although he did, his life is very notable and just the things that he accomplished, not that any of the others was not, but um, today I'm just going to 
showcase George Malone. So with that, I will get started. And um, African Americans faced an almost insurmountable number of obstacles at the beginning of the 20th century. Higher education was very nearly unattainable as the avenues to schooling were limited primarily to only those living in small communities. For the large majority, it was almost impossible to attain anything more than a high school diploma. It is imperative that we understand the challenges that were faced in struggling to succeed. More so, it is vital that their stories be told, talked about, remembered, and recorded for future generations so that they can understand the adversity their parents and grandparents faced and overcame. George W. Malone was the first black lawyer in New Mexico and lived in Blackton, a small community south of Roswell, all black, as well as Roswell proper during part of his life. While it is impossible to fit a person's life and works in a very short span of time, we can still honor him. In the absence of firsthand or family stories, we can only present his life and times in a timeline form from documents gathered and found by those of us who researched the life of George Malone. Very little is known about the early life of George Malone except that he was born on September 17, 1878 in Chattachaw, Alabama. The 1880 census shows that he was living in Sharkey County, Mississippi with his parents and siblings. We know he attended Walden University in Nashville, Tennessee, where he obtained a law degree. He married Bessie Betty Gilmore in Friars Point, Tahoma County, Mississippi on April 12, 1896. To this marriage, two children were born, George R. Malone in 1898 and Moses E. Malone in 1899. Found on the 1900 Beat to Coahoma County, Mississippi census. A June 23, 1908 Vicksburg Evening Post advertisement announces the Mississippi Negro Business League meeting at Vicksburg on July 1st and 2nd, 1908, the fourth annual session. The object of this organization is to promote the commercial and financial development of the Negro. The advertisement states the Mississippi League is affiliated with the National Negro Business League of which Booker T. Washington was president and Charles Hanks vice president. It lists George W. Malone as being secretary of the Cahoma County Mississippi League. Real estate was one of the topics of discussion at this meeting which we can only surmise prompted George Malone's interest in moving west and using his real estate law degree to promote the establishment of an all black community. By 1916, George and Bessie had come to Blackton, New Mexico to escape the Jim Crow laws of the South. We can find no listing of their two little boys coming with them, so we can only assume they had died before the move. Before he was admitted to the bar, George became the school teacher for Blackton School, and Bessie was a postmaster. This year, as it happened, the natural resources started to play havoc with the livelihood of the little community. The aquifer that supplied most of the water suddenly started to play out. Alkali built up in the soil, and worms infested the crops. By the year 1921, most of the residents had moved out the neighboring communities. The 1920 census has George and Bessie living in Roswell at 212 West Bland Street with her father, Richard Gilmore. Their home was mortgage free. George lost Bessie in December of 1920. After Bessie's death, George married a woman by the name of Daisy by 1923. George and Daisy were living in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where George was practicing law, mostly real estate law. Santa Fe, New Mexican, March 10, 1925, 
list George Malone as the second vice president of CP of the Republican Party. His work here consisted primarily of the education and promotion of black children, both in schooling and in learning trades. By 1925, Daisy had died and George married a woman by the name of Lou Lyons. To date, little has been found about George's life between 1925 and 1940. The 1940 census shows George and Lou living in Kansas City, Kansas, with his occupation being listed as a teacher. With that, we can only assume that he possibly was unable to get his bar uh, to be an attorney in Kansas. That is our only assumption at this point. We're still researching his life, however. Um, George passed away in 1945 in Wyandotte County, Kansas. Lou passed away in 1951. They are buried in the West Lawn Cemetery, Kansas City, Kansas. Greatness is not always defined by fame and fortune. Greatness can be defined by doing just one thing in a person's life. One thing that against all odds is achieved and achieved well. For all the things George W. Malone did in his life that sadly may not have been recorded, we know that he persisted to get his education at a time and a place that was against all odds. We know that he did everything within his power to promote and help others to do the same. We know that he was the first black attorney in the state of New Mexico. We know that he was great. And I would like to also share my credits with the other researchers. Asia Brooks, who was the first, is a member of the New Mexico Black Lawyers Association. Judy Flowers, who was a genealogist from Tahoma County, Mississippi. Linda Osborne, a retired teacher and genealogist from Las Cruces, New Mexico. Thank you all for uh, your time and thank you, Timothy, for my invitation. And um, I love being a part of this. And that's it. Janice, thank you. Apps and claps across the ways. Um, for giving us such a textured example of a life and this example of the kind of historical work we're doing. You um, ended with five minutes. We have, so we'll have plenty of time for questions, but because you have a bit more time, I did just want to take a moment, no pressure, um, to see if there was anything else you wanted to share or maybe questions you wanted to raise about how the research you've been doing um, relates with other things you've seen so far. And if nothing comes to mind, we'll, we'll save the time for the questions, but you do have this time. And so I wanted to see if you wanted to say anything else. You know, I can, I can only comment being the archivist here in Roswell. I do have quite a bit of traffic, um, you know, of, of children, grandchildren, great grandchildren who are descendants of um, Blackdom. And the most recent I had is a lady probably in her 70s and she was looking for a plot of land that the family still owns out there, but it's not accessible. Those are the things that I, that I love to help with, that I love to um, see if we, I can help them solve the mysteries and find their family and find where their family walked. And, you know, even if it's just that, I think it's important that we have that and that we share that. Um, I did help Austin, I have to say. Uh, hi, Austin. <laughs> I was happy to uh, visit with him and get to spend a little time with him and I actually, I think, locked him in the archives one morning because I wanted him to do the work and there was so much to do and, and I didn't have time to sit with him and I felt like he could concentrate better without me. But um, that's about it. I, I, I feel very privileged to be here and doing what I'm doing. Thanks, Janice. Um, I'll say, uh, we'll move into discussion here in a moment, but I just wanna say that I hope some of these questions that have been raised about 
method, memory, um, the archival aspect of this documentation, what's in the archive, what's not, the politics of that. I think there's a lot of rich stuff here for our Q&A. So thank you for sure, kind of opening up some of the archival perspective on this. Um, and I do want to just make a note, if, if anyone's in and out, that these presentations are being recorded in case folks didn't know. So um, if you did come in late or you had to duck out early to some extent, um, you will be able to see a recording of our entire session. Uh, you'll get that information from video. Um, so with that, before turning, we will then turn over. We are so honored to have uh, Dr. Ruffin with us to moderate the conversation. So for the remaining portion, we have just under half an hour. Um, Dr. Ruffin is going to uh, offer commentary and guide us through a discussion. And then as there is remaining time, um, if you post your questions in the chat function, it's, there's not Q&A in this one. I, my apologies, technology varies based on the kind of session we're learning. Um, but if you do post questions in the chat, once um, Dr. Ruffin has concluded that portion of the section, we can speak to audience questions as well. Um, so I would just like to introduce Dr. Ruffin. Herb Ruffin is an Associate Professor of African American Studies at Syracuse University. He holds a PhD in American History from Claremont Graduate University, California. His research examines the African American experiences in Silicon Valley, California, San Antonio, Texas, and in particular, the process of Black suburbanization in the American West from 1945 to 2010. Professor Ruffin's book, Uninvited Neighbors, African Americans in Silicon Valley, 1769 to 1990. Um, check it out. In addition, he has authored numerous articles, book reviews, and online academic publish publications that focus on African diaspora history and culture, the Black West, urban studies, and social movements. He's also an active consultant with regard to organizing curriculum, public exhibits, and historical pres presentations on African and African diaspora history and culture, including work with the Smithsonian, Africa Initiative, and serving as US Historian Delegate to South Africa. So what an honor to have you bring your expertise, Dr. Ruffin. I'll hand it over to you to comment on the papers and, and take it away. OK, thank you. Um, in, I'll, I'll tweak some things you know, with that bio. Um, there was another one that I had sent because there's been two books since that time. Oh, great. Do tell us. I'm sorry we missed that. <laughs> no, no, I'll, I'll weave it in. So what I'm going to do here, everybody, is, um, I, and, and I want to keep it flowing because I've been at some panels where I've seen some kind of momentum just kind of stop. And I'm going to do this Black study style in which you just have straight up improvisation and whatnot. Um, there will be a little bit of reading and things, but this is going to be interesting how this turns out. And then we're going to open it up Q&A style going forward. But before going forward, I would like to thank Professor um, Nelson um, for putting this together, as well as Professor Cuba. Cuba, Is, it, is that correct? Cuba or Cuba? Or should I say it in another way? Cuba is fine, but I'm not a professor, <laughs> just a fellow. Oh, all right, all right. But still, excellent work. Um, Mr. Miller, as well as Ms. Donahue. Um, and I hope I have said that properly. I don't want to be hacking up people's names, but thank you for the great papers that have been given and for the, the projects that I've heard, the publications that are about to come out pretty soon, which it sounds like. Um, can't wait to see what the impact of that is going to be. Um, everybody, this is about new knowledge that has been presented right here. And what I hope to do is just to spell out some of the areas, some of the ways and how this knowledge is being created going down the line. Um, and how I'm going to do this is I'm just going to go down my line, talk a little bit about in the background real quick, hopefully real brief, about Blacks in New Mexico. That's what we're dealing with. Get off a little bit into the West in general, and then just talk about how this, all this information fits within what has been described. And that will be weaved within. So we're talking about a place today in Blacks in New Mexico in which there are about 2.6% of the population or about uh, a little bit around like 800 and um, 6,000 people within this space. Um, where the new knowledge comes in, if you're talking about a Black past, most people don't think about this space as having a Black past, if you will. Um, however, 
and you'll hear this over the next couple of days with um, Professor Shirley Ann Moore, as well as Quintar Taylor, Dr. Quintar Taylor. Um, check that out on Saturday. They'll be talking about people like um, Esteban um, Durantes or somebody like Isabel um, de Alvera. Who's Durantes? Durantes is a person who in 1528 came out into the region, was somebody who was an enslaved Moroccan, made the first contact with native people in what is now the American Southwest. However, what his presence, and as I go down, just real quick talking about Black New Mexico, is it's a challenge to this whole notion of um, settler colonialism. You know, it fits within but there is also a resistance element to it, you know, um, in which you're talking about people who are both agent of Western colonialism, as stated through these papers, as well as, you know, uh, in, in conquest, but also people who coming from a group that has been enslaved, going through colonialism, as well as Jim Crow and what, you know, people who are going, who have this resistant element. So it's, it complexes what the mainstream has to say about this um, particular phenomenon, if you will. Um, in the case of Isabel de Oliveira, her case in 1600 within, um, um, within New Mexico, complexes this whole um, situation in terms of dealing with rights, freedom, um, slavery, marriage, as she went about um, basically writing a dip deposition um, as part of a relief expedition to the recently colonized province of New Mexico at that time. And she understood herself to have rights at that time. Um, the person who was the author of that or one of the authors of that, um, who was big off into that research is um, again, Professor Shirley Allen Wilson Moore. She will be around um, to discuss that within a couple of days. And let me see something real quick because I have a, okay, back to gallery view. So something had, clicked as I started looking up right there. Um, as we go forward, this is a history also that fits within the narratives that were written prior to the um, 1990s. And it was very common when we were more talking about a frontier. And in particular, um, when um, with black towns, you had in parallel also, um, Buffalo soldiers who had came out into the region as well. well and you have some writings on that. Um, I am a person, um, similar to Daryl, I am a person who is connected into, you know, um, one of these histories, and that's one of the histories in which a great great grandfather Calvin had came out into the El Paso. New Mexico region had married a Native American woman as part of the Seventh Calvary inside the 1870s and then moved out from Louisiana, moved into Texas. Again, very, very complex type of stuff. Now, with all that said, moving into the next area, you know, since the 1970s, you know, this, this history, the African American West, which this conversation has crept into, if we put a big umbrella over the top of it, it has evolved into an exciting branch of scholarship, of knowledge, new knowledge as we see here. What is significant about it is basically you're talking about interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary today. Um, that connects it, you know, anybody from different type of fields are basically writing about this. And I will make the argument um, by far people who are writing about this. Um, it's not just about 20 historians writing about this um, subject, 20 to 30, give or take. But we're talking about within the hundreds of people who are writing this coming from different type of um, of, of scholarships, different type of fields. Um, where this was picked up, and this is where I will inject some of the more latest stuff or latest work. Um, a couple of years ago, there was a volume that was put together, Freedom Rachel Frontier. And this was also delivered at WHA last year. It involved um, myself as well as a close friend of mine, um, Professor Dwayne Mack, 
um, and we put a, together 16 different chapters. Half of those chapters involve people from different fields. I would say there must have been at least eight different fields that was highlighted within that, doing something along this line where they're interested in people of African descent, either as a musicologist, as a somebody in communication, somebody who's a sociologist, ethnic studies, cultural studies, and we can continue going on down the line. Um, this is coming from all kinds of different type of direction. And then at the key of that is black studies, ethnic studies at the bottom, you know, as a foundation that allows for all this fluidity to take place. So much so that I make the argument um, in a recent article with uh, Montana Magazine, a historiography a couple of months ago, that we should consider this as a field. Now, with that stated, the largest and do, d most dynamic area of study has focused on the Black urban experience, Black political expression in the 20th century, basically a, a period from 1900 to 2000, where you're going from um, within this history that is being addressed. A, a little bit over 710,000 people to almost 6 million people by the end of the century. Um, prior to the 1990s, as spoken about beforehand, most historians had rigorous, rigorously examined the Black West from the 1850s to 1930s. We see this playing out within this history. However, I would say this also, what is special about what I have heard from people is that they're not just resting on stopping at 1930. 30 or 1920 when in, in the 20s when blackdom supposedly went into decline but they're pushing this history forward into the into the current time period making significance out of this whether we talk about um, mapping you know um, freedom project you know or talking about um, hidden histories things along that type of line in these this public history you know, that's important, you know, to push it forward, you know, what is significant about this, that that is the key with with um, how we go about doing this. With that said, also central to this framework was that the African American West has always been significant because it was rooted in strikingly complex race relations with other populations of color and I hope that you're getting this through the talks as well as what I have stated beforehand. Again, I'm a person who comes out of a legacy where you know, you're talking about somebody who would have been considered mulatto or whatnot inside Louisiana on my father's side, but then his son goes off and he fights in the Civil War, the great, great, great grandfather. Then his son goes off and joins the Buffalo Soldier, a Buffalo Soldier unit and marries a Native American woman. This is, this is common throughout this history. Um, also, it's important is anchored in the lived experience and memories of those included. And we have seen this, whether it's dealing with the first black attorney inside New Mexico or dealing with blackdom, as we have seen here, um, as Professor Nelson would tell the history and whatnot, you know, how all this stuff um, connects. Um, oral history as well, not to be remiss of that in the work that um, Daryl Cuba gives dealing with Black orature or Black oral tradition, and in particular one that is rooted within the African diaspora all throughout, not just leaving, make, making this story actually a lot larger than what people initially thought it was. Um, Subgenres that still privilege this approach include, and we're talking about beyond just the urban in the um, political, political expression, it includes sophisticated histories pioneered by folks such as um, W. Sherman Savage in the 1970s, Kenneth Wigan Porters, Porter, Kenneth Wigan Porter, W. Sherman Savage, keep, keep those, those names in mind, you're going to hear them a lot throughout this, this, um, <clears throat> This conference, at least on a couple of other, um, couple of other panels, there was also Kenneth um, Hamilton who was here last year, um, talking about the black townships and whatnot, and Kevin Mulroy, among others, their work on the rural black west, 
Black towns, Black cowboys, African-American, Native American relations have provided firm ground from which subgenres have emerged, evolved, and flourished from a new generation of scholars, including Kendra T. T. Fields, Tia Miles, Bernadette Pruitt. Um, I believe they all were here at the WHA last year. I know definitely Tia Miles was around, Professor Miles was around last year, as well as the professors on his panel. Um, I've already talked about where the field needs to go, and it's already doing it in terms of um, dealing with this um, embrace of interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary. Um, and it, Dr. for Ryan, everybody, yeah. I just want to give you a time check. We have 15 minutes left. Okay. And I want to save at least five for questions. Let, so. let, let, let me complete with this. Take you know, time. what what this leads to is like a fluid, um, research fluidity, as well as a creation of new knowledge, when it's often very difficult to do so if you're just dependent on writ on archives and written material. Um, what and This is my last thing, what is impressive about what has been heard, all the various different methods and methodologies used in this, um, mixed methods, which include oral tradition, Black oral traditional orator, public history, social geography, cultural anthropology, cultural history, ethnic studies, public policy, arguably a little bit of architecture in there. Um, and last, you know, um, last but not least, if you take anything home, this is a cha challenge to that settler um, colonialism model that is so popular right now. Um, it's complex. Wonderful. Third, uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, and I'll invite you if you want to if you want to add to the the papers. But I just want to pick up um, your I think really important comments and in that incredible framing of Black studies and, and historiography and some of the current tensions in the field and with other fields. I think this question about methods and methodology, oral tradition, public history, and and the challenge of the archive is something I hope our panelists might speak to. And with that as sort of a footnote, I want to read a question we have from the audience. Invite other questions to be posted in the chat. Um, and so, yeah, I'd like to invite you all to respond to this and think about how you might want to talk about methods as well. Um, we have a question from Grace Hunt Watkinson. Thank you very much. She, um, they write, so first off, thank you. Um, several students are watching and would love a shout out for Ever History Conference. Thank you students from Kennesaw State University. Um, uh, I know Francis Marion Baker, founder of Blackdom, was from South Georgia originally, so this narrative hits quite to home for most, many of us. Thanks for being here. So here's the question. I am a scholar of late 19th century Apache history, and I focus specifically on the Chiri, Chiri, Chiricawa, I'm sorry if I got that wrong, and Mescalero Apache peoples. This question is for all of the panelists. Do you know of any ways that community members in Blackdom engaged and interacted with Apaches in the region during the lifespan of the community? Uh, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, uh, I deal mostly with the intellectual and the cultural history of Blackdom. However, you, what you'll find in some of the evidence is that they participated in uh, commerce. So there was a Muscular Oil Company along with the Blackdom Oil Company. And in 1920, the two got together. Now, who was a part of the Muscular Oil? Um, Oil company, I'm not sure, but generally speaking, um, it was a uh, transactional relationship uh, from the ones that I have seen. Other than that, uh, uh, there were a few uh, Buffalo soldiers who were in Blackdom and they were a part of the uh, genocidal part of, of colonization in the um, in the borderlands, so. I do have another question, but before I shift gears, I'm just gonna take like a 10 second of silence. Did anyone else wanna to speak to this question about um, Apache in the region? Okay, it's Jana. The only thing I can say is the Apaches, um, they roamed to the west side of the Pecos River. Um, so that would include Blackdom, 
but um, you know, before that, there was a, a lot of um, I want to say more conflicts with the Buffalo Soldiers and the Apaches. Uh, I, I do think there was up in the Fort Stanton area um, maybe some uh, friendships formed between the Buffalo Soldiers and the Apaches. Uh, I haven't done any thorough studies about that, but I have read mention of that. And that's about all I can add to that. All right, I'd like to lift up our next question. And actually, I'm going to do a quick interlude and ask if our presenters would be willing to drop their emails in the chat so that if there are further questions or folks want to follow up, um, before we close out, people will have access to, to take down your emails. So if our presenters would be willing, drop your emails in the chat. And, and just to be clear, Blockdom was on Apache land. Just, just to be clear, that was, it yeah. was on a reservation and it was blocked out according to the colonization scheme. Thanks for that. Um, all right, so another question I wanna raise up, there is currently a growing public interest, this is from M. Pierce, thank you, and money in preserving African-American places and history throughout the American West, but so much of these efforts tend to focus on the built environment. Do any of these panelists foresee a growing or renewed interest in memorializing or preserving Black Dunn, given this contemporary context? So I can, Ali, I can speak to that just a little bit. Um, you know, given that my presentation dealt with some of the memorial endeavors uh, in recent years, um, there was quite a bit of fallout and frustration, certainly in 2009 when, when uh, you know, all of that money disappeared. Um, but, uh, you know, a, a few of those individuals have uh, stuck around. There are actually some children now of people who are involved who are um, at least the last time that we spoke, and, and granted this has been a year or two now, um, we're in the early stages of trying to, uh, to figure out whether there was a possibility to, uh, you know, to reconvene uh, some of these discussions and, and maybe to find a way to pull together some funding. Um, you know, the, the land is still there. Um, it's, it's still, as far as I can tell, undesignated. Um, and so, you know, at this point, um, it's more a question of, of marshalling resources once again. Um, but uh, I would say that, yes, particularly, I mean, um, I can only speak uh, to Blackdom, but uh, yes, there are some things in the works. And so, you know, who knows, once again, right, um, uh, another sort of uh, major unforeseen event with, with COVID that uh, who knows how that's going to affect uh, certainly the purse strings, both of Roswell and the state. Um, so stay tuned, but uh, yes, there are, there are people who are, are working to try and, and at least put together some sort of memorial for Blackton. Um, but it will probably be in Roswell um, just because the, the town site itself is so remote and, and there's nothing out there. So um, yeah. One of, one of the things that I have been doing uh, is to take the uh, intellectual property of, of Blackdomites and turn it into screenplays, um, uh, on stage play, uh, plays, um, TV shows, I, 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 in other words, uh, graphic novels, t-shirts, mugs, whatever it takes to bring to the people's consciousness that there was a place quarantined from white supremacy that was able to function fully and uh, fully mature into their uh, oil exploration era. And to do that before uh, uh, the Roaring Twenties is, is, um, is, is what I try to illuminate. That, that's where I left you hanging with the 1919 and, and we'll pull, pull acreage uh, for the, for the uh, Roaring Twenties. So. Yeah, and I'll also say that um, I do know, so when I talk to my relatives, there are a lot of, and I'm sure this is what Austin and you know, Brian and Tim are talking about, there are a lot of um, efforts to do a lot of, um, you know, things that will help to memorialize Blackdom. But of course, I even am sort of in the um, space of figuring out, you know, how do we take this international? How do we bring these people and these societies and these, these descendants together in a larger context of resistance? 
and to have the local, state, uh, federal, and even international um, bodies, you know, like the UN, uh, to help with this process as well. I think it would be great to um, create an international uh, Freedom Colonies Trail through UNESCO. And again, there's a lot of interest, there's a lot of talk, and there's a lot of sort of chatter about how you would do that. Of course, things like investment and purse strings and you know, those are all the different things that we're all sort of figuring out. But I find that there's a, and even with um, Dr. Andrea Roberts, Texas Freedom Colonies Project, Texas itself, um, I think it's right next to New Mexico, right? Yeah, um, is, um, or at least she at the University of Texas A&M is sort of thinking about these things as well. I find every region has people who are thinking very deeply about how you memorialize these spaces. Great, and we have one question. Dr. Nelson, can you speak about Blacktum Oil a bit more? Uh, Blacktum Oil is one of the biggest mysteries that I am still uncovering. However, it definitely lasted through the Roaring Twenties. Now, the town's faithful, the people who came with the ideas of Ethiopianism, liberation theology, basically the religious uh, part of, of Blackdom, moved once they were set to um, be an oil exploration town site. So, now you have the business taking place in Roswell. So I, I generally have to preface with, I'm talking about Blackdom, but its existence in the people who were in Roswell. So uh, when it comes to that, you had Roswell, who that was a stronghold for uh, uh, the Confederacy um, post. And, and there was still a fervor that landed the uh, first recognized Ku Klux Klan in Roswell. So what you had was is black people with a royalty check or money or a family or a history that was competing with the 1920s narrative of black people. And so the oil company was in the people. So Boyer moves to Vado and he's still receiving a royalty check. Someone moves to Albuquerque and they receive a royalty check and they come back to Roswell to get it or to participate in uh, Freemason activities. So the oil company was literally leasing land under the corporate veil of Blackdom Oil and then it scattered and became more oil companies. And the oil company produced royalties um, well after World War II. So, um, so it was generational wealth, but the actual oil company was mixed up in the, in, in the, in the, uh, in, in the business of the day, which was scattered. There was also Lincoln Oil Company connected to black to oil it's a it's a longer story that requires a paper <laughs> uh but generally speaking yes the the descendants of black Dumb received oil royalties some of them uh after world war ii well we are um running up right against our time um i would ask dr ruffin if you had any closing words we do only have a minute left so i would like to just thank everyone for being here today and then i'll see if dr ruffin wants to close us out um, no, I, I think what everybody is saying is excellent. And, um, you know, the thing that really stood out to me was just basically with this hidden history, um, the, the whole push for freedom, opportunity, cooperation. I think that is at the center of what we're talking about here. Absolutely. Well, thanks again to everyone for being here today. Do make note of the um, information in the chat. I don't know where that goes into the universe, <laughs> um, but please feel free to follow up with the panelists and thanks to our panelists, uh, our attendees. Thank you, Ellie. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yay. Yay. Thank you for attending as well. Thank you, Tim. Woohoo! All right, guys. Now what? Bye. <laughs> I Thank don't one.